and jump right in here. Uh, let's see if I can uh, get my slide to advance here. No? Click on the window and then try. I was there. Yeah, try the right arrow. Oh, here, here we go. I was advancing over here. So yes, so uh, Patrick will be joining as well. And so I will uh, at some point here shortly turn the uh, second half of the presentation to him. Topics for today include a quick uh, look at the current environment. Uh, we will spend the bulk of our time focusing on these uh, second and third and fourth items, preserving and prioritizing care management functions and services. What does that mean? What does that look like in the midst of this COVID-19 virus or epidemic? And then uh, spend a bit of time talking about um, some thoughts and ideas around developing a, an immediate short-term care management action plan to, to help you to uh, ensure that you have really the core uh, functions and capabilities covered and have a, a game plan for how you wish to proceed with care management activities um, throughout the duration of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then uh, lastly, we'll spend some time talking about how to uh, address staffing needs and looking in particular at the availability of potential additional resources in your communities. So first, what is happening today? We have all been inundated with just uh, massive amounts of information. Uh, I know you have probably had the same experience as I over these last few weeks with, with just a continuous flood of emails, of healthcare publication updates, announcements, um, uh, regulatory, temporary regulatory changes, et cetera, uh, that have really been pouring in uh, since the onset of the, of the spread of the COVID-19 a virus across the United States a few weeks ago. So this will be a very brief um, summary of some of the major themes that we feel have emerged out of all of that uh, flood of information and communication and is by no means an exhaustive overview. Uh, but just a few uh, areas that we thought would be good to highlight, and that is certainly first and foremost, has really been front and center in, in the daily news and nightly news updates, and that is the impact for some communities on massive um, volumes of, of uh, ill individuals coming into their emergency departments, many of whom do turn out to be uh, COVID-19 positive and are uh, in many instances acutely ill. We know that New York City has been the epicenter in the United States. Unfortunately, a number of other urban communities are now uh, having the same types of experiences, Detroit, New Orleans, Chicago, uh, to name a few. And of course, all of this really began on the West Coast in Washington State. Again, um, stating what has been very widely publicized, but temporary hospitals and um, urgent care uh, capabilities, facilities have uh, been popping up in these hard hit communities, primarily uh, convention centers, parks. I heard on the news earlier this week, a uh, cathedral, uh, literally the sanctuary, the cathedral being converted to a temporary hospital. And of course, the availability of the two floating Navy hospital ships on the two coasts. Uh, another uh, theme and, and one that has obviously been of great concern and carefully being monitored is the increasing number of healthcare workers who are themselves testing positive for the coronavirus. Uh, another phenomenon that we're experiencing, that we're seeing and hearing about, are physicians and nurses are being asked to, um, to be or being, uh, being redeployed to either the emergency departments and the ICUs in their own facilities or um, being asked to go and help to staff the temporary facilities that have been created. And likewise, retirees are being contacted and being asked to come back. Uh, a number of states have issued calls, uh, New York, California, Colorado, Washington, and Illinois as examples. 
again, to really provide urgent, immediate coverage in those, in those areas of, of crisis need. On the flip side, we also know that many organizations, and perhaps many of you are representing those organizations today, have not experienced yet a, a surge in a, of, of ill individuals coming in uh, with um, potential or actual um, COVID-19 infections. And in fact, are uh, because of the discontinuation of non-emergency care and uh, uh, cancellations of elective surgeries are actually experiencing lower than usual volumes, smaller inpatient census than usual, and lower ED utilization than usual. So we have the two extremes really happening concurrently depending on where you are across the United States today. And that really, um, so, so those factors really have implications in terms of who really is focusing on what at this moment in time. I've already touched on this, but we thought you might be interested to see a couple of um, recent uh, quotes and comments related specifically to the issues of inadequate capacity and staffing. Uh, about a week or two ago, um, the study was published uh, by Harvard. Uh, many of the academic uh, medical centers and, and academic institutions across the United States have been uh, doing quite a bit of data modeling, trying to really understand and anticipate uh, demand and, and also looking in particular specifically at uh, the need for the demand for ICU beds and for ventilators. So this was a, a quote from Harvard, uh, a professor at Harvard, uh, identifying the potential uh, for, um, uh, for inadequate capacity. And then uh, more recently, uh, Governor Cuomo in New York put out a re urgent request asking health insurers who employed physicians and nurses to release them from their duties as, as it was stated so that they could help to treat the uh, massive influx of the COVID-19 patients. And then another area of concern, and that is um, related specifically to the, the impact of all this on the healthcare providers and staff and themselves. So as you see here, concerns about, and, and we certainly are again hearing this on the nightly news, uh, nightly news, and that is uh, individuals talking about putting in 10, 12, 14 hour days, uh, expressing exhaustion, uh, certainly fear of an uncertainty related to their own health and the potential for uh, contracting the, 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 the uh, virus, but also great concerns and uh, fears related to the safety of their families if they're going back and forth between home and, and the healthcare setting. And so there are concerns that medical professionals are likely to experience increases in stress and anxiety, certainly are increasing, uh, uh, increasing stress and anxiety, but also a sense of powerlessness and uh, perhaps even anger, uh, rage, as this gentleman from Tulane um, indicated, uh, really directed at individuals who are perceived as not following uh, some of the CDC guidelines, in particular social distancing. So we have those um, factors at play in this current circumstance as well. So given all of, all of those major issues, why focus today on care management? Care management has emerged as a leading strategy uh, for managing the health and improving the health of populations. And so, uh, I really like the um, definition from the, um, or the uh, description from AHRQ that you see here, that care management is really around the principle of uh, offering appropriate care to individuals within a population that will reduce health risk and total cost of care. And I do encourage individuals to take a look at your leisure or at your convenience at that article that is, uh, we have the link in the, uh, in the slide here. It will be in the slide deck when you receive it. Uh, but I encourage you to take a look at that article if you are interested in more information about uh, care management 
and um, there are there are some some very useful information in there uh, related to um, uh, some of what we will touch on today in terms of the the role of care management. Uh, this really again really summarizes some of the potential impacts that we are experiencing. Um, We've already touched on a couple of these things, but again, fragmented care systems and the, the historic fragility of the safety net in the United States has created a situation where vulnerable community members are now at heightened risk. Uh, and in particular, and we will really focus on this, I'll focus on this a bit more in just a moment, and that is the impact or the potential impact of this virus on those who already have um, complex medical conditions, behavioral health conditions, and social needs. Uh, and certainly there's been a growing attention in recent um, months to the impact in general of social determinants of health. So individuals who are facing housing and food insecurities, lack of transportation, uh, and now the very, very um, real and sudden situation of many, many, many individuals uh, dealing with, um, if not unemployment, then uh, currently um, being uh, furloughed or not having access to, uh, to, to, uh, to a paycheck because of so many businesses being closed. There are resources available, but as many of you have probably personally experienced and dealt with, um, many individuals in the, in the community and population do not uh, really know how to navigate among all of these different programs and uh, potential resources. And so they need help to connect the dots in an effective and efficient way. And so that adds uh, an additional level of stress, uh, particularly for individuals who are suddenly thrust into a situation of being furloughed or unemployed and had not anticipated that and are feeling very underprepared and overwhelmed by that sudden change in their financial circumstances. Well, I can get my slide to advance here. Again, I'm having trouble with that, Benson. Click on it and try the lower left corner. Yeah, there we go. It seems to uh, want to lock up on me here. So we'll spend some time now. These next couple of slides really go to the heart of what we want to talk about today. Um, the immediate care management goals and priorities for individuals who are not currently, for those of you who are in organizations, not currently in the throes of a major influx of ill individuals, uh, Ill, Ill coronavirus uh, individuals, uh, this, this is an opportunity for you to, uh, to take a look at care management explicitly in your organization. And we have identified several priority goals that we would recommend that you focus on if, if you have not already done so. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, and somewhat goes without saying, a goal uh, in during this time period when you're really trying to figure out how to continue to deliver medically necessary health care and services, and that is first and foremost, uh, finding ways always uh, that are feasible to mitigate patient risk as well as your your employees uh, you, and you yourselves and as uh, healthcare providers and staff to reduce your risk of exposure to the virus. The second goal is to find ways to maintain and support your patients' uh, abilities and uh, preparedness to continue to self-manage and control their chronic conditions, but to be able to do so in, and remain in the home environment. And lastly, and directly related to the second bullet, and that is to uh, put processes in place to prevent avoidable hospitalizations and ED visits of your patient population, your membership, if you are representing an ACO or a health plan during and immediately following the, um, the, the dying down of this pandemic. So we have num identified a number of priorities uh, for your consideration. Uh, again, thinking specifically about the, the um, continuation of care management functions and services during this period of time. So what are ways in which you can continue to 
deliver, offer and deliver critical core care management functions and services. And we are recommending that if you have not yet already had to do so, that you take this opportunity to uh, shift and really uh, consolidate focus in the short term on your most vulnerable uh, patients or members, and particularly your high and moderate or rising risk patients uh, from a risk standpoint, uh, risk of um, utilization, risk of um, cost, uh, high cost of care, and to focus in particular on those with modifiable risk. Um, and then to, uh, if you again, if you have not already done so, if your organization has not already done so, to ensure that you are utilizing all available mechanisms to communicate with your patients and your members at this time, how to access care and services. Some organizations have consolidated service delivery sites uh, during the um, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so ensuring that you may have altered hours of operation. Uh, so ensuring that that type of information is widely and broadly disseminated so that your, your patients, your members are well aware of what services are aware, available where and when. And then lastly, um, how to access, access care management services. If one of your, your patients, one of your members is suddenly in a situation where they're, they use home oxygen and they're running low and they're having difficulty reaching the, the home oxygen vendor, then do your patients know who, what to do, who to contact? So those would be some of the critical elements that we would recommend that you think through and ensure are being broadly communicated to, to your patients, your membership on an ongoing basis. And then lastly, um, and we'll spend the, a, a bit of time on this topic specifically, we do recommend that organizations take this time to develop and begin to implement a short-term focused care management action plan dealing explicitly with this current circumstance. So first and foremost, assessing current care management resources and capacity, both looking internally as well as externally, determining if you have any immediate uh, needs to bring in additional individuals, and then uh, thinking through what does that mean in terms of immediate um, training requirements what materials, what resources, what is core information that someone must, must know in order to be effective in, in the job. Uh, examples would be, again, going back to my earlier comments, are there individuals that are recently retired that might be able to come back in and, and plug in and assist in your care management department? Do you have access to PRN individuals who perhaps have not worked in quite some time that you could bring in? And then what would their um, needs be in terms of some immediate priority education and training? Uh, continuing on uh, in terms of components of, a, of an immediate uh, crisis action plan uh, would be uh, to determine and or apply the methodology. If you already have a risk stratification process in place, uh, can that be run um, in the immediate short term to provide you with updated information on the patients or members who are falling out as high or moderate risk, uh, utilizing um, typically risk stratification tools. Uh, for those of you with larger organizations, uh, that capability is uh, most likely uh, available and, and often is built into the electronic health record system. If you are representing a small, a very small rural community hospital, you may or may not have access to uh, those um, uh, risk stratification, embedded risk stratification tools and methods. Uh, but are there other ways that you can, by working closely with your primary care practices, with your ED staff, can you, and physicians, can you quickly generate a list of who are the known high utilizers, your frequent utilizers of the ED, those who are often uh, admitted and readmitted in, in rapid succession. So that you can begin to really build that list of your most at-risk patients or members. And then to move from there to review and prioritize that list, again, the focus being on really um, uh, focusing on those with modifiable risk. And by that, I mean they have, they have risk 
that is um, that, that can be impacted through both um, external um, access to external health care um, uh, and services, and also uh, they are uh, they are modifiable in terms of the individual him or herself having uh, opportunity to, to con have some control over the um, progression or the um, implications. So diet, exercise, smoking would be classic examples of modifiable risk factors. And then once you have identified that that the, those subsets of your total uh, patient or membership, the patient population or membership, then uh, and you've done that stratification, you've you've created that list of individuals who you think um, have modifiable risk. Then to um, prepare a plan, uh, develop scripts if necessary, if you do not currently already have such a thing to guide then proactive outreach to those individuals that you have now identified as being your, your most at risk individuals. Again, we're in an, a very atypical situation. Most routine care has been um, postponed or, or canceled, delayed. Um, uh, preventive care has been, uh, those appointments are typically have been canceled. Um, Elective surgeries have been uh, uh, have been canceled or delayed. So, what are ways in which you can continue to uh, make contact with these folks that you have now identified as being at risk? One of the things that we do strongly recommend is that if you are going to be utilizing non-clinicians to assist in these outreach calls, these proactive outreach calls, that you would work together with your physician leaders to identify and uh, reach, uh, rapidly reach agreement on what are key triggers uh, that would prompt the non-clinician performing that outreach uh, call to immediately refer that patient to, uh, or that member to a, a clinical uh, resource. And again, we would strongly recommend that these kinds of um, decisions would be documented, that you would uh, develop or modify an existing script so that you can then have consistency of, um, of the um, way in which these outreach calls are handled. And then finally, obviously, to begin to actually conduct those um, proactive outreach calls, um, core goals of those calls, as you see here, will be first, as I've already mentioned, you wanna ensure that folks who have, uh, particularly those with chronic conditions, um, that they are continuing to have access to, through one avenue or, or another to medically necessary care and services. I was talking uh, with a physician earlier this week in a, in a, a virtual meeting with a, a client uh, hospital and one of the physicians unsolicited um, said to me that one of his real concerns right now during this time when routine uh, appointments, routine um, opportunities to see their patients are really all on hold he said he was worrying about his individuals with hypertension. He was worrying about uh, his individuals with diabetes and was um, really concerned if he was not going to be able to see them for some period of weeks to months. Um, and then secondly, and there's been quite a bit of focus on this, a number of um, updates have come out in rapid fire order from um, CMS. Uh, related to optimizing the use of video conferencing and telehealth technologies. As many uh, or most of you know, CMS has temporarily brought in access and uh, is made reimbursable a much broader array of Medicare services uh, that are now uh, permissible to, uh, to deliver in a telehealth um, environment. There is a, a good um, new CMS telehealth toolkit that was recently uh, sent out uh, geared specifically for general practitioners. So you see we have the link to that publication here. Uh, there have been a number of very good summaries that have come out specifically related to telehealth uh, during this um, period of the uh, COVID-19 virus. And we would encourage you to take a look at those and to explore all avenues to uh, implement those sorts of um, uh, technologies if you have not historically done so. And then uh, I've already touched on uh, the issue around social determinants of health. Uh, Patrick will talk in more detail about that shortly. 
but wanted to, again, as you are thinking about uh, and as you are uh, and perhaps already doing uh, proactive outreach to your uh, vulnerable and high risk, uh, rising risk members or patients, that you would, um, again, uh, would strongly recommend that your staff utilize a standardized um, basic, uh, it can be a simple assessment tool that would incorporate uh, core social determinants of health. The CDC has a very good um, tool that is uh, on Louise, you just went quiet. Well, Patrick, I guess uh, can you jump in until Louise gets her audio back? I sure can. I sure can. As a matter of fact, I think we'll take it to now. If I have the uh, the ability to drive and click to the next slide, that will help. Can you give me that permission? Because I can't seem to do that. Yeah, it looks like she's gone offline. So I think the uh, internet connection in her area may have gone away. So I am going to become the presenter and I'm going to show a PowerPoint. It should be in about the same area. And I'm going to give you keyboard and mouse. All right. And see if you can advance. That looks promising. Right there. there you go. Okay. Now, is that advancing? Uh, why don't you click on it again? My screen is flashing. There we go. Try, try it again. There you go. Now you're doing it. Okay. All right. We, um, we. We're referring to these two items as our critical success factors. You know, Louise covered a lot of ground, and um, but there are two things that we both felt really strongly about as, as, like I say, critical success factors. One is that what we've been talking about today and what we'll continue to talk about here uh, really does require a great deal of collaboration and cooperation in the community among the providers and payers that make up your uh, your healthcare system, and that we're going to need to, in the process, streamline workflow as much as possible, avoid duplication uh, of of outreach to shared patients, which can become annoying, and eventually they sort of turn the noise down. Uh, unfortunately, the second. Uh, critical success factor, and forgive me, but I'm uh, like you at home with dogs, uh, establish a consistent process to ensure that deferred or canceled follow-up appointments are carried forward and rescheduled for those folks that have chronic uh, disease. And I think uh, there to give you an example, if somebody was one of those patients that the um, doctor was worried about, and they're not coming in for a regularly scheduled appointment that you keep track of those folks and you're able to see them as soon as possible uh, once they can uh, uh, get out of their homes and, and back to uh, outpatient visits. Okay. I'm trying to click through to, to next slides here again, Benson. Here we go. So we've talked a lot about um, you know, the problem, as it were, and now I want to start talking a little bit more about the solution and uh, sort of summarize the work we've done so far to say that in order to best deal uh, with the crisis and maintain health systems usual uh, or regular typical slate of surgeries, cancer treatments, labor and delivery, uh, and what would ordinarily come through uh, the ED, uh, it's going to be very important that we manage staffing levels in the ED and the ICU. Number two, in order to meet the needs of, of all people uh, and uh, the needs of the ED and ICU, particularly high acuity needs, uh, we're going to need to, and this is our premise, we're going to need to leverage 
significant numbers of case managers, care managers, care coordinators, and community health workers that are available within and across communities. There are admittedly some health systems that are so robust that they're not going to need to leverage uh, other professionals in the community. However, as you move away from our metro areas and into more rural areas, uh, it is true that we're going to need to leverage as many uh, community stakeholders as we can. And that's what we're going to talk about next. The result is a, a flexing, if you will, of care management for the duration of the crisis in a way that assembles care and case managers and coordinators as a common core that can align with that patient risk. So, you know, when Louise was talking about stratifying the risk, uh, identifying people with disease registry, for example, uh, you know, the uh, folks with diabetes and COPD and heart disease and, and whatnot, assigning to them the most qualified medical professionals, care coordinators, uh, and medical case managers, but at the lowest risk uh, being flexible enough to assign community health workers, uh, you know, bachelors in social work, uh, case managers who can provide a different level, uh, subclinical level of case management. That's the design we're after and I'm going to try to click through to the next slide. Here it is. Uh, I'm not going to read all the words on the screen, uh, lucky for you, um, but what we did do was come up with a sort of a quadrant approach to this that indicates for you where high degree of medical need meets high degree of behavioral and social need and uh, at the same time where low medical needs meet low behavioral and social needs. Uh, we can approach each of these very differently. Our goal is to unencumber the hospital, frankly, from as much of the behavioral and social needs that are in fact low to moderate and certainly medical needs that are, that are low. Uh, we want to try to do as much of that in the community before people step foot in the emergency room as is possible. I'm going to go to the next slide. Let's see if this will work. It did. Fantastic. Thank God for Benson. Um, here you can see again what I was talking about, that we'd have qualified medical case managers and care coordinators at the hospital level. Uh, and in the other um, uh, kitty corner uh, quadrant there, the, the low medical, low behavioral and social, we could use our community outreach staff, benefit enrollment staff, our navigators, social work case managers, our peer support specialists, and where are we going to find those if we don't have a, a plethora of them in our facility is that we're going to go down the street and talk to people in the mental health and substance use disorders uh, treatment centers and see what staffing levels they have and if they would be willing uh, to cooperate with us. Social service agencies, you know, charitable, nonprofit, faith-based organizations, any social service provider that has case management staff, most of them do, as a matter of fact, housing and shelter providers, uh, we want to uh, be talking with them as well, and even the criminal justice system. Uh, for example, in, in the juvenile justice arena, they may be uh, there may be case managers on staff that we can leverage. So I think we know where we can find those more qualified medical case managers. Uh, you can see that on the left-hand side as well. But sometimes it takes a little thinking and a little doing to think, where are we going to find some of these other folks that we could use? Okay. And I'm, ah, uh, there we are. So. Uh, just to help you visualize the steps you could take, number one is to convene, convene with those various providers in town uh, that I was talking about, and they're listed there for you. Um, 
And number two, to engage, engage in a conversation that says, look, you've got community outreach staff, you have benefit enrollment navigators, you have peer support specialists, social work case managers, and can we enter into an agreement now uh, that says if and when they're needed, let's do this in advance uh, of the crisis uh, in our community, if and when we need to pull the trigger on this approach, what we'd like to do is have this core of uh, case managers, uh, for lack of a better term, deployed in the community in a way where they can interact with our lowest and moderate risk patients uh, and uh, be there for them, uh, in some cases physically, uh, and in some cases uh, using telehealth technology, supporting people who are at home, uh, perhaps on a computer, and taking them through, uh, you know, screening and putting plans together for them, navigating through benefit enrollment together with them. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we believe uh, we all need to, to do. We need to cooperate to make this happen. Otherwise, as the social and behavioral wear and tear continues to wear and tear on people, our emergency rooms uh, are not going to see fewer people, they'll see more. And they're going to be coming in for reasons like uh, behavioral health uh, concerns. All right. It, it's going to be important. This is just another way to help you visualize those low risk folks being diverted from the emergency room into uh, case management, navigation, benefit enrollment away from the emergency department. And, uh, but they very likely will, in some cases, need to be some information exchange between uh, all these players. And so from an infrastructure standpoint, you might be thinking about how do we track and monitor all of these cases and make sure that people are, in fact, uh, you know, closing the loop and going in uh, and getting the help that they need or connecting by phone uh, and getting the help that they need. That then is gonna leave the high uh, risk patients free to uh, be treated professionally by the medical case managers and care coordinators. So we wanted to give you, again, just a, a visual sense of what that looks like. I am gonna try to click through to the next slide. This, again, you know, the dotted line showed the uh, separation of, of hospital and community. Uh, now that we've got this particular slide under control, I wanted to share with you um, the social determinants of health. Uh, you know, we talked about the erosion, the high risk that for some people their household income is going to uh, take a hit, their housing stability is going to take a hit, their food insecurities are going to go through the roof. Um, this is happening now. I think there's a good chance it's going to continue to happen. Uh, I don't know if you all saw the unemployment numbers today. Uh, there were another 6.6 .6 million people applied for unemployment, uh, bringing the total to nearly 17 million people in the last three weeks. Uh, so there's no doubt that some of these uh, social determinants of health are going to get worse before they get better. and um, having a way to screen for those is important. One of the tools, the PREPARE tool, which stands for the Protocol for Responding to and Assessing Patient Assets, Risks, and Experiences, uh, is available um, and uh, ought to be used, either this tool or the CDC tool that uh, Louise was referring to, and you're gonna capture an awful lot of very good information about the, um, the social wellness, if you will, of the people that you're going to be seeing both within the hospital and hopefully without uh, the hospital. People that you can intercede, you can deflect and see them uh, either uh, virtually on the phone or via a chat, uh, using um, video conferencing 
or that you've set up a physical location, a pre-emergency department, if you may have seen, I know I've seen plenty of those on television this last week where uh, there's a, an impromptu, sometimes a tent set up in the parking lot of the hospital just to keep people who don't need to be in the ED uh, out of the ED. As far as screening for behavioral health concerns, if you uh, don't already have uh, a slate of tools that you can use, I'm pointing you here to uh, some mental health screening tools, the PHQ-9, the SF-12, uh, Beck scales. There are a wide variety of Beck scales uh, for depression, uh, suicidal ideation, you name it, and substance use disorders, uh, scales as well. There's no question that for people who uh, have uh, substance use disorders, uh, this is going to exacerbate the conditions uh, for them as well. It's going to exacerbate conditions for people who might have been borderline uh, alcoholic or drug addict. Uh, this may really provoke uh, some people and um, we need to be prepared for it. We were already in the midst of an epidemic of drug overdose and we were already in the midst of a real spike in suicide and anxiety and depression. So this is only gonna compound those conditions and we want you to have some, some tools at the ready. And uh, making referrals, uh, I wanted to um, first of all point out that I understand how difficult it is to be dealing with a crisis and making referrals. Which that's precisely why we really want to encourage the development of a uh, an outside case management, care management resource that is a, a cooperative effort that sits outside the ED and, and uh, that can manage making referrals on its own. And by pulling case managers in from other agencies as partners, uh, uh, perhaps with an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, a letter of agreement, uh, that uh, codifies the, um, the cooperative effort, those case managers are going to know better than anyone where the resources are and how to tap into them. Uh, so it's a, uh, hopefully going to be a weight lifted off the shoulders of hospital staff. Uh, they also understand that effective referral making requires really good relationships. Um, that people know if I call you, you know who I am when I'm calling. Uh, generally, you know why I'm calling and we're gonna take care of each other. Making and, and keeping referrals, closing referrals is something that is, uh, quite frankly, uh, needs to be mutually reinforcing, mutually beneficial. It's not a one-way street. Um, effectively making closed loop referrals is gonna require documentation it's going to require communication and it's going to require information flowing both ways. Um, and uh, the people that do this best, again, they, uh, these are people that are managing um, benefits enrollment and, and community level case management. They, uh, they really know their stuff. So uh, that's the kind of thing they're gonna be looking to do. From a strategic standpoint and, and, and taking this idea that, yeah, we're interested in, in creating this uh, capacity in the community, uh, we now need to put the tactical together and we're gonna need to convene our local stakeholders. And, uh, you know, in this webinar, we talked about schools, uh, which are, of course, a place where you can find nurses, you can find uh, case managers and, uh, social workers. We've talked about uh, me mental health providers and substance use disorders, treatment providers, housing, shelter providers, other social services. You're going to want to invite and convene the community of stakeholders. And sitting together in a room or uh, sitting together in a virtual way, you can um, pretty quickly get a sense of what are the assets we have in this community. And uh, if somebody needs uh, SNAP 
uh, you know, food stamps in a hurry? Do we know where to refer them? Do we know what to expect when we make that referral? Uh, how are we going to manage benefits enrollment? We've got, we're going to have a real surge of people wanting to enroll in Medicaid, for example. When you have 17 million people becoming unemployed uh, in three weeks, uh, they're going to hit the Medicaid rolls and they're going to want to get enrolled as quickly as possible. So how do we manage that? We're going to have to work together and um, let's identify a model that we all uh, are willing to subscribe to. Uh, we're going to need to perhaps co-locate or maybe we want to do this all virtually. We need to be on the same page when it comes to that model. Uh, we're going to need to identify all the staff that we can include in that case care management and coordination model. And some of us are going to be lending staff, um, and we'll talk about the money in a minute. Um, and then we're going to need to coordinate them, categorize them into the low, moderate, high, and extremely high risk strata. And then uh, we're going to align our population health indicators accordingly and leverage uh, the COVID-19 stimulus, the CARES stimulus to fund this flexing of human resources uh, and flexing in some cases of a, uh, uh, could be the, the telehealth technology to make all of this work. Um, and that's real important. Uh, you know that uh, we talked about Medicare uh, being a payer of uh, case management and so forth. There are over 40 states that have uh, had CMS approve what's called an 1135 waiver. This is that emergency waiver. And in most cases, those uh, Medicaid 1135 waivers will allow for the reimbursement of telehealth if it wasn't already allowed. So a lot of infrastructure, uh, you know, can be paid for by billing services to Medicare and Medicaid, and where there uh, is stimulus funding available, the uh, the CARES stimulus funding uh, to help with staffing and to help with infrastructure, please take advantage of it. Uh, the truth is you're going to need to work on uh, developing an operation that can stand up properly uh, with proper workflow, business process, we talked about information um, needing to be communicated bi-directionally. So how are you going to do that? Um, and then, you know, to the extent that you're going to be doing this virtually, having the infrastructure quickly established to do that uh, so that you can then go on and make those referrals. In terms of getting paid, uh, we just talked about this a minute ago, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, check with commercial insurers in your area to see if they're paying for telehealth and uh, care management, case management, and of course the uh, stimulus funding. And now we're going to stop and uh, we'll see if Louise was able to, to join us and we'll take your questions. Louise? Yes, I have rejoined. I have no idea what happened. I lost total connectivity, so I do apologize to everyone. And uh, well, hopefully I will not uh, be cut off again. Well, welcome back. And if anyone has questions, this is a great time to use the question box and type them in. I do have one here. And I was wondering, I don't know which of you wanted to help with what are the modifiable risk factors? Um, sure. So um, the basic definition of modifi modifiable risk factor, and I had touched on this earlier, but they're really um, described as, as factors that an individual has control over and that can be impacted then through um, care management activities, uh, availing the individual, uh, the, avail the individual availing themselves of um, programs, um, you know, meeting with the diabetes educator, as an example, attending smoking cessation classes, um, enrolling in an exercise program, or um, committing to exercising to reduce um, to reduce those risks um, from the standpoint of long-term um, long-term illness, and to reduce or certainly slow the progression of chronic diseases, heart disease, high blood pressure, et cetera, that we hear so much about. 
Um, and so they're really, um, there are factors that the individual can control and if minimized, uh, the definition is that the, then they will, by, by that reduction, it will increase the probability that a person will live a longer and productive life. And so um, those would be the kinds of things. An example that would not be a modifiable risk as you're thinking about your total um, panel of patients or your health plan or your ACO membership, you're really going to want to focus care management energy, care management time and resources on working with individuals where the care management interventions can make an impact. And so if an individual is, um, they are an oncology patient and they are on very expensive chemotherapy drugs, but they are otherwise, um, you know, they're, they're coping, they have sufficient um, home care, um, access to home care resources and support, and they don't have any other major underlying health conditions, then they probably don't need a lot of care management support at that point in time. Um, th the alternative would be an individual who has um, diabetes, um, hypertension, COPD, but is willing and committed to you know, finding ways to improve their, their weight, their, um, you know, their exercise and so forth, um, but, but needs help and needs guidance and needs um, access to supportive uh, services and programs. Great. Okay, and the next one is, um, do you believe this model can help identify people who might be most at risk for behavioral health concerns like suicide and addiction? You want me to? I'm not sure which yes. of you would. Uh... Yes. Patrick, why don't you uh, take that one? That really uh, touches on some of what you've just uh, spent time talking about. Sure, sure. The short answer is an emphatic yes. Um, and that's assuming that as part of your intake process, um, part of your interaction with people, that you're screening for um, behavioral health which includes both mental health and, and substance use disorders and those social health uh, dimensions. And that's where the, uh, the list that we had up on the screen of mental health screening tools, um, uh, substance use disorder screening tools, the PREPARE or the CDC tool that help identify social needs, um, you know, putting that on the front end of your intake uh, from the get-go, not waiting and saying, okay, well, we're going to scramble and do a bunch of stuff, and then maybe someday we'll add these things. That we are, and I really want to underscore this, we're in a very, very difficult position because we already, uh, you might be familiar with the term uh, that has been made popular, unfortunately, in the last uh, five years or so, these deaths of despair. Uh, you know, since the Great Recession, our numbers around suicide and overdose have done nothing but go up. So, we, and we know that this social isolation uh, is only going to make matters worse for people. And uh, I think we have an obligation to screen from the beginning. Uh, and, and it's why the model we're describing says let that screening take place uh, over here not in the emergency department and engage your community resources to do that uh, it's too much work for a hospital for example you've got to get the whole community participating and we got to we got to find people and we got to take care of them otherwise our numbers are going to be bleak all right well thank you and we another question when doing care management which is time intensive how do you tell the story so payers know the good work that's being done, i.e. getting someone housing or food or mental health intervention? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I would say um, certainly having um, uh, solid documentation. Um, so each time the care manager or the care coordinator is, is, is doing that outreach, is um, interacting with that individual, and is um, working with them on an agreed upon care plan that you would have that documentation available. 
uh, that there would be some specific um, goals and objectives of the care management interventions, uh, whether it's, um, as I mentioned, um, you know, weight loss or exercise, um, whether it's uh, helping the individual to better understand and therefore be able to control a chronic condition such as asthma, which can then directly translate to reduced emergency department utilization. Um, ED utilization and readmissions, avoidable, potentially avoidable hospital readmissions are probably the, the top two metrics that you see um, consistent, consistent, consistently in the literature and um, would be the types of um, quantifiable uh, results that a payer would be looking for. Um, there may be performance um, contractual performance uh, requirements or, or thresholds that have been set forth uh, that certainly can be true in a um, pay for performance kind of value-based reimbursement arrangement. So it will, it will depend on the nature of the relationship with that payer, um, but those would be some examples of ways in which the, um, the organization can tangibly demonstrate the positive impact of um, that care management intervention. All right, well, thank you. And also there's a comment that part of the solution for people with behavioral health concerns is telehealth. Is that allowed and reimbursable? I'll go ahead, um, Benson. I, I had talked about that uh, with respect to Medicare. Yes, with respect to Medicaid, uh, you're going to want to look at your state's 1135 waiver and any uh, other uh, 1115 waiver that would have preceded it uh, to be sure, but there were 40 or more of these 1135 applications, these emergency applications that have already been approved. And <clears throat> like I said, one of the options exercised by most states is the option to allow for payment of telehealth uh, very much in the same way that Medicare is, uh, which is with very relaxed uh, rules around it. And, um, you know, I think when you do the research, and we're happy to help you do a little bit of that research too, um, they've made it extraordinarily easy to do telehealth. In addition, uh, one of the things I want to make sure everybody uh, realizes is that today the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, um, ha has made available $200 million in grants for telehealth infrastructure. So to the degree that you need technology to do telehealth, if you or anybody else you know need, uh, you know, some uh, financial resources for that, you'll be able to apply beginning today with the FCC, uh, and they're making, like I said, $200 million available beginning today. So please take advantage of it. I, I do hope that telehealth becomes part of our new normal. Uh, there's no reason uh, for it if we can keep uh, people uh, secure and private uh, and facilitating those uh, conversations. Well, uh, Patrick, uh, okay. Benson, this is Louise. If you, uh, if I may, just uh, add to what Patrick sure. has just uh, shared, there is a very good CMS uh, uh, just published uh, on March 17th a very good fact sheet. Uh, the title is Medicare Telemedicine Healthcare Provider Fact Sheet. Uh, it is available on CMS.gov on their website. And that um, gives some very good, um, very specific guidance in terms of what has been temporarily, uh, what is temporarily allowable, and, um, and and talks about the types of services, the settings of care, um, and as Patrick just said, they have really removed just about all of the traditional um, uh, restrictions or limitations. Uh, but it is a really good um, uh, summary of the. Um, of the uh, opportunities that you now have. Again, it's called Medicare Telemedicine Healthcare Provider Fact Sheet, available on cms.gov. Excellent. Well, it's the top of the hour now, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. And so I will say thank you very much and 
Louise and Patrick, if there are any final words as you want to sign off, this might be the time. Well, I would like to thank everyone for participating and attending today's um, today's webinar. If you have follow-up questions or if you had questions that you didn't have an opportunity to submit, please do not hesitate to reach out to, um, to, to Patrick or to myself. Our contact information is uh, shown there at the beginning of the um, slide presentation. And then also you would have um, that information on our respective websites. So please do not hesitate to reach out to us if we can answer further questions or give additional information related to some of the topics that we have covered today. Thank you again, everyone, for, for, for your participation. Yes, thank you and stay well.